Well, good morning. We're trying to uh, step into the events of Holy Week and uh, maybe ignore a little bit about the, what the world's going on around us for just a moment, a brief time to kind of settle into this uh, great story that's part of our church history, uh, the the broader church, uh, not just our, our local church. And uh, what a cool thing it is to recognize that you're a part of a big story and not part of a, a little story. And so these, uh, these events come to us. And uh, one of the things uh, that I notice when I'm sitting here reading, uh, mo- most of all this is coming from uh, Matthew 21 through about Matthew 24 or 25. So if you want to read along uh, in these days, that'd be a great thing. Uh, Matthew 21 and 22 is kind of where I- I'm looking at today. And uh, one of the things that I that I noticed in the middle of all of this is that we all have a preconceived notion of what Jesus is like, right? We You've, you've formed some opinions uh, about the way Jesus handled himself as he walked on the face of the earth. And I would dare say, at this moment in history, most of our perceptions of the way Jesus handled himself are very milk toast and very boring. And he just kind of walked around and stopped the waves and helped people who were sick and loved people. And he was gentle and he was kind and he was always this and he was always that. And it's always kind of this uh, kind of wimpy version of Jesus uh, that, that we kind of collect on to almost to the point where these stories that are that are here in uh, Matthew 21 are almost hard for us to read uh, because th- Jesus comes across as pretty intense and pretty harsh about some things and this last week of his life when it matters the most about some clarity on things he is not mincing words and he is not afraid to um, to divide. You know, we, we kind of like look at peace as being kind of this grand thing. And, and, and we for, kind of forget that Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword because uh, we're uncomfortable with the sword conversation and we're very comfortable with the peace conversation. But Jesus was both of those things. And so as you, as you, if you would be willing to read these stories, you'd, you'd see some of these issues that are coming up. Uh, so there's this story about Jesus at the temple. And, and I talked, I wrote about that yesterday. Um, there's the story of Jesus cursing a fig tree uh, where, you know, this tree doesn't have any fruit. He's on his way. He's hungry. And he curses this tree and makes it die. And it's kind of like, you know, uh, you know what's going on here, and there's the parable of the, uh, or there's the authority of Jesus is questioned, and so uh, the classic case of he asks them a question that they can't answer, so they just gets them more frustrated. Uh, the parable of the two sons, there's the, the, you know this parable that speaks about uh, there's a man and he had two sons, and one of them he asked to go work in his field, and uh, his son said, well, I'm binge watching Netflix, and so I'm you know I'm busy today, I, I got too many video games to play, so I can't go, uh, but at some time in the course of the day he feels guilty about his answer and so he goes and works for in the field and then uh, his other son is like you know eddie haskell like oh sure dad i'd love to go go work for you i'd do anything for you uh and that son goes out and he doesn't do anything he doesn't go to work uh he doesn't do what he's asked and so jesus says which one of these two people did the will of his father and uh you know and then he gives that answer and that's found in Matthew 21, if you want to go look at that. Uh, then there's the parable of the tenants. And the, the parable of the tenants uh, also has a kind of a crazy ending to the story about God's reaction towards these people who uh, didn't do what they were supposed to do. If you remember the story, uh, the tenants take over the vineyard for the year. Uh, they uh, The master sends some of his servants to come collect the profits from that, and they kill them, and they kill some other people. And then he says, I'll send my son. Surely they'll respect my son. Well, they killed him too. Uh, And before you know it, uh, verse 43 and following lets you know what Jesus feels about these people who did that to him. And there's there's a pretty shocking response that Jesus tells this story that's so harsh. Um, And then there's the story of the wedding banquet. Remember that? Uh, There's... Man's going to have a, a wedding banquet, uh, and so he sends out pe- uh, requests to people, and people like they don't want to show up. So he's like, fine, if you people don't want to show up, I'm going to ask anybody to come. Uh, and so then a whole bunch of people come, and then one of the people that comes isn't really dressed appropriate for the banquet. Uh, and Jesus has something to say about someone who's not dressed appropriate for the banquet. You'd think that, that uh, this story would go to a place where Jesus is peaceful and loving and kind and gentle. And uh, there's there's kind of a shocking end to that story. Uh, and then there's the, it continues on with uh, paying the, the tax to Caesar. And uh, 
some discussion about that. There's a uh, discussion about marriage at the resurrection because the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. And so they're trying to trick Jesus with a question about, you know, a guy marries 10 different people. Who's he going to get uh, resurrected and marry? And and uh, Jesus kind of has some, some harsh words for them. And then uh, it moves into what's a kind of a cool moment. It's uh, another moment when the great commandment is uh, been given is like what is the greatest commandment in the law and Jesus replied love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind and this is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments and so for a group of people who had you know tens of commandments and hundreds of regulations to uh, make sure those commandments were, were met Jesus reduces it to the two things that matter most. Love the Lord your God and love people the same way you love yourself. And what a cool thing. And, and, and in the middle of this last week of instructions that Jesus wants to give to people, um, it's a refining moment. It is, like I said in my blog, that, you know, that last moment that you have a chance to give some instructions to your loved ones. And not not just the classic, you know, I love you, make sure I tell you I love you. He's Jesus is setting up for the kingdom of God to be worked out through these guys. And so he's got some uh, expressions that need to be taken place, not only just that he loves them, but here's the work that needs to get done. And here's the things that are important. And here's the things that aren't important, okay? Uh, and so it, it ends, this whole, chapter 22 ends with a discussion about whose son is the Messiah. And, uh, you know, there's all, all kinds of discussion. It, it ends with this, and, I, and I'll end our devotional time with this. It says this, if, if then David calls him Lord, how can he be a son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day no one dared to ask him any more questions. <laughs> it's a dangerous thing to think that you can come to God with some questions that are going to trip him up. Ooh. I got the magic question. He's never going to get this one. The wisdom of God, uh, the foolishness of God is smarter than the uh, wisdom of mankind. The smartest question that you and I can come up with is like, you know, one plus one uh, to God and his uh, ability to interact with us and uh, share with us and uh, get us to different conclusions than the, the the brilliant questions we think we can come up with. I encourage you to uh, to read through some of the more difficult moments that Jesus has with people because I want you to think about the things that he's confronting in the middle of their arrogance, in the middle of, and it's always easy to, like, it's their arrogance, right? It's not not my arrogance. I'm I'm different. I'm smarter. I never would have been those people. Uh, but we would have been, right? I mean, that's the startling recognition in my own heart is that if I was there in that time, I would have made the same bad mistakes, most likely. Um, but who is the Messiah? And on this march through Easter week and this, this march to the cross and this march to the, you know, the glorious moment for all of humanity, uh, Jesus is is attempting to overturn some tables in some people's lives. And uh, like I said yesterday, I recognize Jesus probably has that same need in my life. And to, to live in some open honesty about, you know, what are some of those tables that I hold so dear uh, that prop me up uh, with a sense of myself that, that I need to kind of be okay. And which of those things are not helping me be okay, right? That's the uh, that's the story. And to, to kind of get past our thoughtfulness about Christ is kind of this way. Christ and God uh, manifest himself in, in a lot of different ways, some of which are really hard for us to accept in our world that has become exceptionally obsessed with everything being nice and pleasant and gentle and kind. Um, Jesus didn't leave room for that because as if you read some of those parables, it, it, it is a moment of recognizing that there is a hell. There is a separation from God that is tragic. Uh, and God's trying to lead us to life uh, instead of death that we're on. That's my thought for this morning. Let me pray for us. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we want to find life, and we recognize that uh, life and death are this curious balance that to uh, find life, I have to uh, experience death just like Christ did. And so, Lord, what does it mean for me to die? And what does it mean for uh, me to surrender? And what does it mean for me to uh, recognize my, my need to be raised from the dead? Now, just be cleaned up and be a nicer guy and uh, be a little bit better to my wife and to my neighbor and to my kids and to my dog. Uh, but to recognize that uh, life needs to come into me that I could never make happen. And so I, uh, I thank you for Christ's words to people. I thank you that um, your intention in speaking hard words to people is always about bringing life to them if they would listen. And so, Lord, help us to be people that would listen. In your name I pray. Amen. God bless your day, and we'll, uh, we'll see you on the blog tomorrow. Take care. God bless.